a special welcome to Dr. Jade Cha, and we have quite a uh, background here. I am excited to have her. Um, we went through a PhD program at Dallas Baptist University for seven years, so I got to know Jade very well. Um, she was the valedictorian. She was the unspoken leader. Um she was raising her kids during this this whole season of getting a PhD. I really look up to her, and I'm excited about this uh, podcast. So welcome to the uh, Pillars of uh, Leadership podcast, Jade. Well, thank you for having me, Dr. Doug Hagdorn. <laughs> so excited. So your dissertation was the cultural intelligence of faculty working with international students. So tell, tell me just a little bit about that five years of torture. Yes. <laughs> well, the torture was mainly because gathering data from university faculty is extremely difficult. I remember I told one of my friends who also has a doctorate about how I was going to collect data. And he said, you might not finish like flat out told me, you just might not finish. Faculty are not interested in doing more surveys. And I said, no, <laughs> I will finish. You just don't know how stubborn I am. And <laughs> somebody told me once that you don't have to be smart to get a PhD. You have to be stubborn to get one. And Good. I just found out how stubborn I was. Um, but I approached this topic of cultural intelligence and international students because I myself have been an international student. I have also been a domestic student and a student who lived in her own country, but didn't speak the language. For example, I was born in South Korea, but I moved to the States when I was two. And English is my first language. But when I moved back to Korea in the first grade, I didn't speak any Korean, but my parents put me in a Korean school. The problem was being Korean and not being able to speak your own language was a huge burden. And it was very hard for years for me. But then they moved me, uh, then we moved to... Germany. My father worked for LG, might have heard of the company before. And when we moved to Germany, they sent me to an international school. And there they didn't know what to do with me again, because I spoke and understood English like an American, but I was illiterate. Like by the, I, left, I left the States when I was in the first grade. I mean, how much do you actually know how to read and write? But I didn't keep it up when I was in Korea. So having to be tossed around in many different educational situations made me think back to what was it that made me successful? How am I here today? And if I look back and one of the key factors was the teacher. The teacher made all the difference. There are some teachers who flat out compared me with my extremely A plus honor roll school representative class president sister, older sister, who would say, Jenny's like this, why aren't you like that? Like to my face <laughs> and to my mother during parent teacher conference. And they showed it on their faces. Like we're in middle school, we're very sensitive to how people feel. And I knew when a teacher did not like me because I was different, I couldn't read or write. And they pretty much thought I was stupid. So um, writing this dissertation was almost a passion project for me because I wanted to see how people with high cultural intelligence teach their students and how those who did not score high, what, what was the difference? At the end of the day, they all love their students. Like when I talked to these faculty, even if they scored high, every single faculty who I talked to loved their students. And some faculty even said, hey, since you're doing this, can you give me some advice? Like after the recording was over, they say, what, what did some of the other faculty say? Can you tell me? And even if they scored low, they wanted to know, right? So that's, it's, it was a really fun dissertation for me. I mean, of course, the writing part is hard. And mm. going back and forth and feedback, Dr. Hagedorn knows what it's like to go back and forth with your committee and uh, just have to rearrange your entire dissertation, all of that. It's extremely hard. But for me, I think it was worth it. Because I get to apply it as a professor. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I ever want to be on a dissertation committee. I, I don't know if if uh, when applying for positions, you can check that box or not. But what a what a torturous thing that is. You you have done since you graduated amazing uh, 
speaking of leadership, how much you've excelled um, just with cultural intelligence, cross-cultural ministry and communication, contemporary global issues. You got your master's in Christian education, your bachelor's in voice performance, um, and you're certified now as a consultant, a facilitator, and a lecturer in the Cultural Intelligence Center. Tell me a little bit about what that is and, and why why would you go get somebody to to grab grab a jade to go bring bring you into an organization um for advice or for counsel? Why is that important? Absolutely. I think a lot of my consulting, uh people think it's just cross-cultural as in maybe different ethnicities or races, but it's so much more than that. I mean, I have young children who at the breakfast table talk and I have no clue what they're saying. Right. I'm like, they're like, never dig down, never dig down. And I was like, what are you talking about? And my oldest son's like, Josiah is talking in Minecraft language. Right. How, how am I supposed to know that? Right. So uh, a lot of my consulting, I, I make sure it's like, I want everyone to know that the cultural intelligence is not the boogeyman. A lot of people I think that, oh, this is a, you know, cross, this is a competency, uh, seminar or they're trying to make us feel bad, feel bad about myself. I've had a lot of those fears. I've had somebody who sit there and be like, well, you don't go deep enough. You don't go, um, you're not calling out the people who aggressed against us. I've had all different kinds. I've had students say, I don't know, you made me feel bad. Uh, so there's all these different kinds of perspectives when it comes to culture. Recently, I had a meeting with somebody who was um, a very well-known gentleman and he said well culture and intelligence cannot exist in the same sentence wow yeah <laughs> and i said yes yes it can <laughs> so um a lot of these times pe because of the definition of culture not being established it's viewed as something to be feared and mm. For me, culture is the way you've been programmed to see life. Like everybody has a cell phone, right? Like my voted sticker. Anyway, so um, everybody has a cell phone. And this is by Jared Hofstede. It's his definition, but I absolutely love it. So it's every, this is your hardware, right? What runs it is your software. Your software is your culture. It's the way you've been programmed to see life. Everything you know everything you've seen everything you've been taught since the day you were born is your programming and at the end of the day when i do my seminars i want everybody to reflect it's like what is your programming you can't get along with somebody else if you don't know how you will react mm. so a lot of the times it's self-reflective so i give a lot of examples like this is what my family is like how do you react because our hot buttons go off when we are faced with something unfamiliar. So my job is to help everybody identify what is not common to them, what is not in their cultural programming, so they are no longer afraid of it. So that's usually what I do and it's so much fun. I make it fun, we go back and forth in the room, we give examples, we do table talk. Yeah, I, I enjoy it, I think it's fun. <laughs> well, it's what you're describing I think is ethnocentrism, right? It's it's kind of your you talk about programming. It's it's the standards, the culture, your preferences. I think Livermore calls it preferences, but I think it's more than preferences. It's just how you're built and how you were born, how you were raised, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I I always give the example of when I gave birth to my first son. I had a Korean mother, a Taiwanese mother-in-law, and an American pediatrician all to giving me different advice. Right. And that's my son's culture from the day he's born. He's born into three different cultures telling him how to live. Right. But as he grows older, nobody tells you this is how you're being programmed. Mm. Right. So my son runs hot. And every day my father-in-law says, put on a jacket. And he goes, no. And he goes, no, you're going to catch a cold. And my son being an American says, or he calls himself Texan, but <laughs> says, you don't catch colds by being cold. You catch colds by getting a virus, right? Oh, no. 
just stop, just stop. <laughs> That's so disrespectful. Asian wise, you cannot do that to your grandfather. <laughs> so, it's like, I have to do be like, just for the sake of family peace, can you at least take the jacket <laughs> in your hand when grandpa takes you to school because mommy can't take you and then take it off, shove it in your backpack at the, as soon as you get there. But for the sake, it's like, stop arguing with him, science. Just put it on, right? So, <laughs> Yeah, well, he's you've already done, Jay, just having graduated, you know, a year ago, a little less than a year ago, and just being able to to do the consulting and the work you've done um, and and bringing value and, and adding value with two boys and, and raising those boys. And congratulations on your citizenship. That's been what, a couple of years? It was during our program. Yeah. Yeah, so I had to change my name during our program legally to... And I told my husband, you know, we've been married 10 years and I think I should one, get my citizenship and two, change my last name to yours. I think I'll keep you. It's been 10 years. 10 years? Yeah. No, I mean, we were married 10 years. Okay. By then. Okay. Okay. And so I said, okay, you know what? I'll change my name to yours. <laughs> yeah. Cause the citizenship was four or five years ago then. It was about four or five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot going on in the world in america with with immigration and lots of opportunities for leaders here in america i was looking at a survey recently 90 percent of executives from 68 countries identified cross-cultural leadership as the top management challenge in the next century and i started to kind of drill down a little bit myself thinking well well why why is that and you look at how it's hard to attract and retain talent these days, but you look at the workforce and how diverse it is, ethnic and organizational cultures. You look at, I've managed uh, leaders across different uh, continents and countries and matrixed environments, and it's, it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity for leaders. So it's, it's a passion, but where do you see that as an opportunity for leaders? I think, so they say leaders get hired for their IQ, but fired for their low EQ. Right. And so you got to help with the acronyms. I know it's emotional intelligence. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so in, most people know IQ, right? It's the measurement of your intelligence. And then EQ is emotional intelligence. So you can get hired for being the most brilliant engineer in the world, but then you would get fired for not being able to manage because your emotional intelligence is low, right? So now take that to the next level, right? Because how you portray emotion and how I receive can be different compared depending on our cultural background, right? I always give this example in, in my class, I have students from Brazil, right? And I always joke when they look at me, I feel like they're looking into my soul, right? I was like, oh my goodness. Like when I'm teaching, they like looking straight at me like, yes, professor, right? So sometimes it's a little bit scary. And the reason why it's a little bit scary is because from where I grew up in South Korea, uh, we were not allowed to look at the professor straight in their eye. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was extremely rude. And I remember being in first grade, Looking at the prof uh, looking at the teacher straight at her face because I was, I just moved from the state and she slapped me across the face, saying, wow. "How? Yeah, she's like, how dare you? How rude of you?" She found it so insulting that I looked straight up at her. She slapped me, right? So having to work with these different kind of cultures, even expressiveness, and having to understand how different cultures work and value time and value off time, all of that. If you're going to go into a cross-cultural situation globally and even domestically, I mean, United States is probably the most diverse country in the world, right? When it comes to different kinds of ethnic groups and backgrounds and cultures, you have to, you have to know how to work with different kinds of people or else you can't keep your job, right? You can't, you can't function. You cannot be a leader that is effective. Leader is, leadership is influence. You can't be a positive influence if you can't cater to the people you are working with. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, you're a leader and you have to take command and sometimes they do have to adjust to you, but it doesn't have to be like that all the time. 
right? So absolutely, it's so important. I completely agree with what you read. Well, you, you remember our buddy James McGregor Burns, right? I mean, he talked about this reciprocity and a symbiotic relationship, right? That is not one way. And so as a leader, you have an obligation to influence, inspire, yes, but get to know your followers. And I was speaking with one of my international uh, ex-employees just this past week in preparation for this podcast and was talking to her about what things were were meaningful to her in past leaders and, and myself. And she said, just getting to know me, just getting to know my background, just hello, pronouncing my name correctly, right? Some of the simple things as leaders that we don't even take the time to do. And you'll, you'll hear that in graduations and leaders will get up on the stage and they can't pronounce someone's name, right? That That's meaningful. And so, you know, that reciprocity and symbiotic relationship is, is really important. Have you had leaders um, in the academic or ministry and corporate world who've done that well and or not done that well where you've learned from that well uh when i was doing my dissertation one of the most common thing that people who scored high said was i apologize to the student in advance if they have a difficult name and ask them to correct me and that came up out of 12 i think at least more than half because it became mm. one of my it had to be at least six people to have said it and they made it a point to say, if it was, I try to say their name. And if it's incorrect, I ask the student, please let me honor you by saying your name correctly. And Good. when I heard that, I was like, that is so beautiful. It's so beautiful because it means that you care about them as a person. They're not just somebody who's passing through. And that means a lot. And you earn their respect almost very quickly as well. And so having that said by multiple people, professors who scored high meant a lot to me and the fact that a lot of them said these students are so brave to come to a country that is not theirs and to do a mm -hmm. higher education level work is so brave it's like imagine if somebody took me and said you're going to go to Nicaragua and start writing a master's thesis like that's never going to happen <laughs> right? I would say no absolutely not right so like a lot of the times professors need to shift their way of thought when it comes to working with students and those who scored high absolutely did that. And they were so good at it. And you hear their stories and how much they loved uh, putting themselves out there and inviting the students in mm -hmm. to their office and making sure they have a pot of tea available for them to sit down and just talk with them. That made, that made, that just made my dissertation so much fun in that way. The interview process was the best part. Yeah, I was, now, I was talking to, oh, go ahead, finish up. Oh, yeah. And then there were like the other side where, I mean, they love their students, but some professors said, well, from their country, it's okay to cheat. So I need to teach them what it's like not to cheat. Right? And I said, oh, okay, well, um, in some countries, it's okay to just regurgitate. And that's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to have an opinion, mm -hmm. right? But it's just they didn't take the time to research and understand the background from where they came from, right? right? Because for them, having an opinion is rude, right? So it can it really changes the difference. And then I'm going to be honest, at being an Asian woman, a lot of the times people confuse me with the other Asian lady. Uh, at institutions that I've taught at. And I said, are you kidding me? There's only two Asian women who are in this school who are faculty and you can't get my name right, which was mm -hmm. also sad because a guy who kept calling me something else uh, works with that other lady, but he doesn't work with me. So I was like, the entire time, did you think I was her? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's just stuff like that happens. And now I'm at the point where I just stop and correct them. Before I was shy and I was new and I felt like I couldn't, but I said, no, I think we're at the point where I should be able to stand mm. up. From. That's good. That's, that's authentic leadership and being, being willing to do that. You know, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with some of the simple things, but 
and I'll ask you how to define CQ or cultural intelligence, but I, you made me think back to one of my employees, PN Raju from India. And I would get complaints about him that he wouldn't speak up in meetings or make eye contact. Same thing you were talking about. And I had to go research myself on that culture. And it would have been easy for me to write that off and just go along with the multiple feedback uh, mechanisms. And uh, even in writing that said, he, he won't make eye contact with me. He's very shy. Well, he's introverted, but he's also trained that that is respect. And you're superior, you won't look in the eye or you will, you won't correct. You won't even give feedback. So I had to work as a leader to figure out how to deal with him and how to get his candid feedback. And he was, he was one of the smartest guys that ever worked for me. And so um, this whole concept of, of cultural intelligence, can you give us a little bit of what, what that means to you and what, what that means in the workplace or in academia? So cultural intelligence is the capability to function and relate effectively in cross-cultural situations, right? So it's a skill set. Most people think, oh, like IQ, you're born with it, right? Like EQ, like emotional intelligence, CQ can be developed, right? Um, CQ was developed actually on the backbone of emotional intelligence. The thing with emotional intelligence is your ability to read and understand other people's emotions, regulate your own. There's a whole capability uh, construct. They have five constructs that makes it emotional intelligence. The problem is cross-culturally, it doesn't always translate. So if you get emotional intelligence and you add the cultural aspect of understanding how the other person might respond or like, is it a character issue? Is it a cultural issue? It's giving you a language, a skill set to be able to identify things, right? And it gives you the capability to be effective in a diverse situation. Mm, that's good. Yeah, David Livermore, I read um, his his book, one of his books, I guess he has many, but- I read know, all his books. <laughs> you've, you've met with him, he's a mentor. Um, you know, he talks about culture- being very broad, right? I mean, you you look at a an organizational culture and you'll just think about how people how how people act, how they talk, but it goes back to their beliefs, to their values, to their behaviors, to customs, traditions, attributes. And so that's a, it it's more complex than than people think, right? I mean, there's the the, the ethnicity and the nationalities and but then there's generational organizational it's pretty complex right jade you got it all figured out no way <laughs> i'm learning all the time i think um so it's in dr livermore's leading with culture intelligence book he has a picture of an iceberg and what you see of the iceberg is you know 90 percent of the iceberg mass is underwater Right. And the tip is on the outside of what we see as humans above the water is only what we can. That's what we call cultural competence, competency, like seminars where you're like, mm -hmm. oh, this culture believes in this and this culture, you know, they eat this, they wear this, they do their makeup like this, like this is appropriate, not appropriate. That's above the water. That's everything you can see. But then Dr. Livermore brings it down into a much deeper level called cultural values and values is what you see under the water. And if you, um, Preaching and Cultural Intelligence by David Kim, who is also certified in cultural intelligence, wrote a book about uh, preaching and how it's, um, there's several layers and you wanna go all the way from the outer layer to the middle is cultural values and the inside is their beliefs. Like mm -hmm. what do they really believe about something, right? So it's cultural about, the thing with cultural intelligence is just you can, do the outer layer, the mass above the water or the iceberg to make sure that you start off on the right foot, right? You don't want to start out upsetting somebody culturally, right. but then if you want to go deeper, you have to understand what they value and what they value determines how they live life. And understanding that about people who work with you will make all the difference in the world. 
I was I was talking to a um, lieutenant colonel who talked about going out of your way and making your own cup of coffee. And I just said, well, what do you what do you mean by that? And he said, you know, at his level, he was able to have somebody bring him a cup of coffee. And he said, no, I'll go make my own cup of coffee and walk the distance to the coffee pot and talk to people on the way. And that take time. I mean, that takes time. He had to calendarize it. He had to schedule that to get to know people. And so it's easy as a leader to develop your own vision as opposed to having shared vision, um, to develop your own strategy and your own goals, but taking the time to get to know someone, to get to know their beliefs, to get to know their values is a precursor to getting them to buy into your values and vision, right? And so that's not an easy thing. And most leaders won't take the time to do that. You look at at Lincoln and Washington and in the old days, and they took the time to, to ride amongst their leaders and to, to sit and talk. And so what you're talking about here is is simple and people know it on the surface, but it takes time to do that, right? Did you have a leader um, in the academic world or ministry world or job world that, that took the time to do that and to get to know you and that had a an impact on you or just did it never happen? Um, I have several, at least from Dallas Baptist University. I have Dr. Um, Goodyear, as you know, Dr. Jack Goodyear. Uh, I could walk into his office and just have a half an hour conversation and he would be opening, uh, he's just open to listen to anything that I have to say. And he was so encouraging and always wanting to encourage me. And it's just, he, he really was good at empowering the people he worked with. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a skill set in itself. And he would know how to do it according to what the person likes. It's very, it was very easy to work for him. So I told him if he ever opened a university anywhere, I will follow him. I was like, I will go with you. Just open it somewhere and I will be your first faculty. Tell me what to teach and I'll teach it. Right. Okay. So so as a as a follower, and I've done a lot of study on on followership, but so so you're saying you would go follow this leader anywhere. What let's let's drill a little deeper on that. Why? Um, it's not often you see a leader who is willing to talk about controversial topics. He didn't care so much about what people thought when it came to what he believed, his convictions. And but he wasn't rude about it. He wasn't mean about it because he's so eloquent in very many ways. It's just, it's almost funny. But at the same time, it's he, he was willing to fall on his sword for me when I was trying to make changes to a department because there was pushback. In academia, there's always pushback when you try to sure. change something. And I was trying to change a lot of things. And he said, Jade, if you want, I will fall on the sword for you. Tell me that you want it and I'll do it. And I was just four months into the job like who what leader does that what leader says if i i trust in you i believe that you know the students well and you know what's best for the department so i will i will follow my sword for you mm -hmm. and i'll never forget that mm, that's good yeah i was i was reading this week i've been doing a lot of preparation for a podcast i have coming with the uh some uh, army personnel and so i i looked at this topic of falling on the sword and leadership. And when you get a leader who has a lot of experience and a follower who doesn't, yet they have great ideas, you're mentoring them, um, you want them to succeed, you want to model as a leader. One of the best things you can do as a leader is allow them to fail and take some risks and maybe not fall on the sword for anything and everything as a leader, but then let them discover um, a right and wrong decision. And that may take some extra time to say, let them go research. I was researching this or, or reading about this one example where they let the follower travel 
overseas to go meet with a couple other people before they made their decision. He as a leader already knew the decision was, was poor and it was a wrong one, but he didn't want to tell the follower that he wanted the follower to discover that themselves. And so he let him travel overseas, spent money, took an extra three weeks. And then the follower came to the conclusion that it's not the right decision. So he was willing to fall on the sword, but he said, well, before I fall on my sword as a leader, I'm going to see if they'll fall on the sword themselves. And that particular occasion, they did fall on the sword themselves and decided it wasn't the right decision. So as a leader, you'll get opportunities and many leaders won't take the blame. They won't fall on the sword. They're worried about their reputation. Um, how it will look in their own eyes. I think you you make a great point is how many leaders are willing to fall on the sword for their followers. And actually speaking to which what you just said, and then the second thing he said was, but do you want to win halfway? Like, do we want to, if you want, let's, why don't we no negotiate so we get like three or more, three fourths of it passed. And then we can let, do work on the quarter some other time or we can push all of it through and see how it goes. I'm okay with whatever you choose. Mm, good. And because he said that, I said, let's let the quarter go. Um, we'll do the three fours. That's really That's good. I, like. I had I had one follower and this is a, a job I no longer hold, but she came in and it was late after hours. No one was around and she just saw I was in the office and stumbled by and said, hey, let, can I get your opinion on something? And so you bring up this concept of being present, being available as a leader. And so it was a you know 15 minute discussion, but um, she saw that I was willing to take the time with her. And she said, hey, it was a complex situation because she worked deep down in my organization. She said, I know that I have a leader who won't approve of my recommendation. And I believe in my heart of hearts, it's the right recommendation. Do you have any advice for me? And so she opened up and that was an opportunity for me as a, a leader to, to listen and, and inject some potential wisdom anyways. And so my question to her was, well, if you know you can't get your leader's support, do you have others that support your recommendation? And she said, well, yeah, but they're outside of my organization. And so we, we long story short, I, I said, well, we'll go and get those leaders support and let's go as a, a coalition, right? Get having advocates maybe outside of your organization to go make those recommendations. And so she, she had the diverse perspectives she knew that her leader wasn't going to support it, but she said, we agreed jointly to let's let's go get some other inputs and then come make the recommendation as a cross-functional input and not just yours. And guess, guess what? The leader approved it. She wouldn't have approved it if it was just hers because there was a pride factor, somebody in my organization, but it was a, it was a cross-functional uh, coalition that brought that recommendation. So um, this whole concept of, boy, you could go down a rabbit trail, DEI and diversity, and there's so many um, ramifications and, and misperceptions that come from that. But there's value in diversity, right? You're a living example of that. Well, I think the misconception is people think that if you just have a diversity, diverse working group, innovation will happen. But that's not true. You have to have a diverse working group that understands cultural intelligence and is willing to have motivation to get to know each other, take the time to build the knowledge and research, strategize on how you're going to work together and put it into action. It's not just, oh, diversity equals innovation. It's diversity with practicing cultural intelligence equals innovation. Otherwise, diversity just equals fighting, to be honest. <laughs> so, just fight. But but you do talk about this cultural intelligence, and I think people are are numb to it before they even know about it. And if if you just open up and look at the different opportunities, um, 
and there are ways that we are different. And you look at that culturally with our, our global workforce, and you have to know that as a leader. I had a staff in Mexico that if I didn't know how to deal with them or manage them or lead them or collaborate with them, it would have been disaster. You have to look at how one society negotiates, how humor works or doesn't work, right? How you can motivate, what are the motivational techniques, communication styles, role expectations, whether it be gender, uh, religion, politics, eating, economics, capitalism versus socialism, and an election year. These things are all critical as a leader, right? What, which ones are the, the most critical and how do you go about as a leader figuring those out other than hiring you? Yes, they should hire you, okay? I think ultimately um, all, of us, all of those are important. It's getting to know the individual. Because although, I mean, not everybody has a similar history to me, not everybody lived in four different countries going up. So it's really hard to put an identifier on me, right? So although I have to, man, I limbo between three different, I do a tango between three different cultures all the time. Uh, I'm okay adapting to whatever I need to adapt to almost as a survival skill. Mm. Right? And I think if people took the time, the problem is people, humans are naturally lazy. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Humans are naturally lazy. We don't want to be bothered. We don't, especially when we have to learn something that's completely uncomfortable and out of our element. It's finding that self-efficacy to say, you know what? I'm uncomfortable, but I'm okay being in this uncomfortable space so I can get to know how to do business differently, how I can talk to somebody about religion differently, missions, um, business, education, all of that, as important as it is, you have to know the individual. Mm -hmm. Because each individual, although, you know, I, I look Korean, I am very much American. Right. So it's it's you can learn as much cultural stuff as you possibly can. But at the end yes. of the day, it boils down to the individual. Yeah, I um, you talk about self-efficacy. Now, you academic, you no. um, some some people. I mean, it basically it basically means building up, encouraging, edifying, uh, collaborating. And I had one employee and this is a shout out to her is she is my biggest advocate now that I've moved on from a position. She she was so diverse, so different than me, different country, different religion, different background, different skill set. But I invested just just a little bit. Not 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 a lot in her, but I just she was my first risk in hiring somebody to work remotely. This was pre-COVID. And we had never hired somebody uh, to work remote. And now that's a little more, you know, reasonable and you can justify it. But she came through with flying colors and now she's my biggest advocate. And I, I, I didn't invest in her to get something out of it. But as a leader, it was this whole concept of servant leadership is, you know, getting to know and investing. And so I think you hit the, the nail on the head is practical ways she she's an advocate now um and she's an advocate for for many leaders not just for me but because she has been discriminated against and she's seen that other side and and some of it is unconscious bias can you talk to that a little bit where people you and i look at us totally totally different and so i may not Think of you the same way, and you may look at me and go, "You know, you need some more hair." Come on now, um, talk about that a little bit. I okay, unconscious bias is a whole nother. It's like a two-hour seminar I give. <laughs> That's like I can. I don't know if I can reduce it to a short time, but I think a lot of the times our brains we call it affinity bias. So our brain naturally gets attracted to what we are familiar to, 
right? Kind of like our cultural programming. So anything that is unfamiliar, we have a tendency not to want to deal with it. And one of the things that you can check personally, everybody can go do this at home if they listen to this podcast, is write down the five closest people to you. Write them down by age, gender, race, religion, education level, economic status. Just, just those six things. Write those five down and find what is common, right? And then see how everybody, most people will actually find out how undiverse they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when it comes to the closest people. And so if you're only getting a perspective of the people who talk, act, and think like you, then you are not, your drive is low, right? You're not taking the time to be fed different kind of information, being able to process it. You don't have to agree with them. But if you're only in the same bubble and circle all the time, you're going to start thinking about the other side as others. And that's where we don't want to do. We don't want to think about them as others. Uh, one of the biggest thing about unconscious bias is um, actually two of the biggest things that I emphasize is explaining away. So earlier I told you about the gentleman who told me about a cultural intelligence can't be in the same sentence. So I told that to my friend and his response was, well, he's a judge, so he's used to saying whatever he wants. That's what we call explaining away, right? And then when I told you about the faculty who kept calling me the other faculty's name, I said it to one of the other male faculties and he said, oh, he gets everyone's name confused all the time. Explaining away is making excuses for the aggressor, right? It's like victim blaming. It's yeah. like, oh, you're the one who, who shouldn't feel bad because that's just who they are, right? A lot of the times, instead of explaining away, the first thing you should do is acknowledge, right? Say, oh, I'm sorry that you went through that. How can I help? Can I help help the situation? And the second part with unconscious bias, especially if you were if you received a microaggression, is to be an advocate for the person who received that. That's good. Right. It would, it would have been great if somebody said, you know what, let me go talk to him and remind him that that's not okay. Or because I when and then if you can't have anybody advocate for you, you need to start advocating for yourself or else you perpetuate the behavior, Yes, right? He's going to continue to think that making those inappropriate comments is okay because nobody ever calls him mm -hmm. out, right? So that's what some of the things when it comes to unconscious bias, uh, the two things I usually emphasize and who is in your inner, inner circle. Can you expand your inner circle to somebody who will open your mind to things that you didn't know or didn't even think about. So that when you approach them, they're not scary. Right. You're talking about courageous followership and there's, there's a really a uh, couple good books on that. And, and there's some risk to that, right? Standing up, challenging your leader, or even doing the things you're doing by saying you pronounce my name wrong, you know, or you're calling me somebody who's down the, down the aisle for me. And so taking those risks, you're also managing up and you're also helping develop your leaders. And so I encourage people to do that. John Maxwell, I think, was one who said, you're the five people that you hang around the most. And so I encourage leaders to hang around with other people and take someone to lunch who's who's not like you and, and, and invest and develop. You mentioned, Jade, practical ways to interact with international employees and students. And so I jotted down a few here. Um, shared, sharing heritage, getting to know a little bit about their background, pronouncing their name correctly, learning greetings in their language. I'm young. I see you. <laughs> yeah, I, I learned that just for you, okay? Thank you. Well, technically, you, you can say I'm young to me because power distance wise, I'm younger than you. So, <laughs> sorry, I I tried. Um, <laughs> learn one one word in their language. Um, research their culture. Ask for insights and diverse perspectives. Build those personal relationships. Anything else you'd add, just as a kind of a last takeaway for leaders to be able to relate? Listen. Hmm. you need to listen you need to stop and listen because in the silence you'll re you'll learn a lot in your silence while you listen you will learn a lot 
one of the things I was taught in negotiation school is the best negotiation tactic is to say nothing and just to listen and people will will talk out of awkwardness and you'll get more information than than you expected. But it's the same thing here that you're talking about is taking the time to listen actively. Well, Dr. Jade, I appreciate it. Thank you for being on the Pillars of Leadership podcast. Thank you for your friendship, your leadership during our seven years. You're amazing. I wish you well, and people need to hire you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.